also known. Oh, thank you, uh, Rosie or Jordan. Um, also known as Plantac. So um, Dina is not able to uh, join us today. So um, Jordan just put in the agenda in the count uh, in the chat box there at the bottom. Uh, figure we'd go through our um, roll call real quick. Um, so we've got a, a fairly quick way we do that here at RGC TAC. I uh, go through each of the communities. And if you are here alphabetically, so hopefully that uh, helps most people. Um, if you're if you're part of that community, uh, unmute, announce, uh, introduce yourself, and we'll we'll move through this. So we'll start with uh, Alta, Bluffdale, Brighton, Grant's here from Bluffdale. Oh, thank you, Grant. Sorry, I burned through that too quick. Uh, Copperton. Cottonwood Heights. Hey, I'm Samantha DeSilhorst. I'm the new senior planner for Cottonwood Heights and happy to be here. Thank you. Draper. Scott Collier. Todd Draper. Todd and Scott. Um, Immigration Canyon. Harriman. Mike Moy, Harriman City Planning Director. Hey, Mike. Holiday. Kearns. Uh, Shane Ellis, uh, Kearns Engineering. Thank you. Magna. Midvale. Adam Olson, Community Development. Vandeline Knoblauch, I'm the Senior Planner. Elizabeth Arnold, Planner as well. Great. Uh, Mill Creek. Murray. Riverton. Carrie Nikase, Director of Public Works. Hey, Carrie. Salt Lake City. Mark Stevens, City Engineer. Great. Salt Lake County. Uh, David Rogers, Salt Lake County uh, Planning and Transportation. And Stay. Shane Ellis. Oh, sorry, Shane. Yeah. Thank you, Shane. Uh, Sandy. South Jordan. South Salt Lake City. Uh, Dennis Bay, South Salt Lake City Engineer. Hi, Dennis. Taylorsville. West Jordan. Dirk Burton, Mayor of West Jordan and Master Electrician. <laughs> awesome. Mayor, we've got several should be. Um, Scott Lang for Community Development Director. All right, West Valley City. Steve Pastor, Community Development Director. White City. Shane Ellis again. Thank Shane. Uh, UDOT. Well, I don't know about the rest of UDOT, but Jared Usman from Aeronautics is here. Thanks, Jared. Uh, UTA. Uh, our federal highways uh, partner here. Anybody from Envision Utah? Cody, let's hear. Hey, Cody. Nice, nice job last night on the event. And um, let's see, WFRC, we have, let me see if I, uh, can find everybody. We have Julie Bjornstad, I'm Jory Johnner, Ted Knowlton, Yu Van Wagenen, Burt Granberg, Rosie Hernandez, Michaela Jordan, Nikki Navio, Jordan Chandler. And I think that's WFRC. Um, and then anybody uh, that was not called upon uh, through a local community. Do we have any other uh, consulting firms or anybody that jumped on late that didn't uh, introduce themselves? Yeah, this is Scott Cuthbertson, uh, Deputy Director of the Point of Mountain State Land Authority. Thanks, Scott. Mike Sopcha, Communications Manager oh. at WFRC. Mike, sorry about that. And I 
see, oh, Lauren Victor's on also. And I see Spencer Hymas uh, is also on. So uh, with that, um, if uh, you join, or we'll kind of keep track of see who joins, we'll have them put their name in the chat. Um, go down the agenda, uh, looking for approval of September 21st, 2022 minutes. Um, hopefully everybody received those uh, last week when we sent out the agenda. So can I get a motion to uh, approve those? Thanks Mercedes. I move to approve. Thanks Scott. Do we have a second? All right, we had, I think I saw Wendell in second. Uh, all in favor, uh, wave your hands around or put a thumbs up. Uh, any opposed? All right, that's easy. Okay, um, so we've we've started categorizing the uh, agendas into three main categories, um, regionally significant projects and housing, open space, AT, green space, disruptive technology and policies, and then Below that would be kind of any other topic. So underneath the regional significant uh, projects and housing, uh, we've got three items today, uh, context sensitivity con conversation. So Julie and Ted will talk about that. Um, I'll discuss RTP and then we'll talk about um, guiding our growth in the UL UI uh, conversations. I think that Ted will lead. So uh, Julie, are you doing the context sensitivity? <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's hard with two screens of your, where the unmute um, button goes. All right, so um, this is going to be a presentation about a new project study focus that we have here at WFRC, um, looking at context sensitivity outcomes in our local and regional planning um, and other work that we do here at WFRC. So today we hope that you take away um, an understanding of the work that we're doing, and then at the end, I'll be asking for any volunteers from local governments that want to help us in crafting this framework. Um, so context sensitivity and ensuring that our land use and our transportation um, match up is core to how cities can work better. This, oh, I don't know why it's so slow. This, um, this project is focusing on um, how transportation and land use work together in, in our centers. This is shown here on our Wasatch Choice map. And um, there's value to doing this within our regional transportation plan. So the primary framework of this, although it can be extended to any sort of context that we're, we're talking about in planning, is when we put projects in the regional transportation plan and develop them further. Um, the main reason why we believe that this has great benefit is that it gives us greater predictability and better decision-making um, as we think about how our road should function and how our road should be designed. This project is um, in partnership with not only the Wasatch Front Regional Council, but UDOT, UTA, um, MAG, Mountain Land Association of Governments, the MPO, um, the WFRC of Utah County, and then the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. So we're all working together to um, craft this framework. Um, so the framework is you know, for balancing regional transportation needs with community context and vision. This is to establish a shared vision and guidance on streets within center. Um, it's not a perfect We're hoping that um, this framework helps us focus on more functional outcomes and tools that we can use um, to make better planning decisions. So um, the framework is broken down into essentially six elements. Um, balance, so recognizing regional transportation needs, community context, values, vision needs, um, and the balance between them. Providing multimodal choice in a complete connected network. Increasing safety, enhancing places, strengthening economies, and forging effective partnerships. Um, so each element of the framework will have a series of tools. Those will be um, principles or overall statements of guidance a checklist for things to review or consider, um, how to work through trade-offs and then performance measures so that we can um, see how our system is, is working. And so our initial idea is that um, each one of those things are focused on four 
street types within the centers, which would be main streets, um, major corridors, hybrid main streets, um, Sorry, I was just going to define that for you, but now I lost my notes on exactly what that means. Um, and then supporting streets. Um, so though, so that's essentially what the framework is doing. It's helping us think about our centers, um, the types of facilities within those centers, how they're functioning, and then what our goals and trade-offs are for, for those, um, those roads. And we, like I said, have been working through the transportation agencies right now. Um, and we would like to get input and feedback from local communities who need to be um, part of this conversation and are a valuable part. And so what we're requesting today is asking you um, on this call if you would be interested in one or two meetings where we're walking through the framework and walking through some of the considerations, um, getting buy-in and getting information from you about how you think this will be most effective. Um, so you can either volunteer now or you can um, send a message, an email or something to um, ted at ted at wfrc.org or julie at julieb.org. Um, and um, there are people who are introducing themselves in the chat, but I will go ahead and take Ian, Spencer, Ellen as volunteers since you did technically sign up in the chat. And Ted, is there anything that you want to add? Well, I, I think this question of should streets be designed differently based on their context is one that a lot of you are exploring currently with uh, with UDOT. Uh, and the, I think the idea here is to highlight where that may need to be addressed earlier on in the planning cycle so that there's sort of a shared understanding about uh, the locations and the general approach uh, towards improving that kind of fit. So I think that that uh, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, and you know, we're all just trying to find ways to have more safe outcomes, enable and encourage more economic development near streets, uh, you know, those are some of those uh, benefits that come from a better context sensitivity. And I, I, I'll just editorialize that the partners, UDOT, Mountain Land Association of Governments, UPA, they're all supportive of the general objective here. Um, and it, I think a lot of it just comes down to the where and the how. And so if uh, you can help us figure that out, and really think about, well, how would this land and affect local government? Uh, that's really helpful. And I'll just <coughs> uh, parting, parting thought here is that this is not intended to, to solve the details early on. It's more intended to um, elevate issues and kind of point towards uh, general direction uh, based on facility type. That's it, Dory. We have already some volunteers and email. I um, put in um, both Ted and my chat and feel free to either email us, chat me here. Um, you can also call me. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. It looks like we've had a few others join. So if you <clears throat> missed our uh, introduction piece, just uh, you know, put your name in the chat and uh, also sign up for uh, uh, what Julie was asking. So um, I have the next agenda item. So I will gonna do a brief um, update on our regional transportation uh, plan. So can everybody hopefully see my screen here? Just doing some rearranging with uh, windows. Um, so a uh, quick reminder, the Watson Street Vision um, is our three-legged uh, process that ties economic development, land use, and transportation together. Um, our entire planning process is built around those 10 goals you see on the right side of 
uh, the screen there from livable and healthy communities to you know quality transportation choices, sustainable environment. Um, we look at all those as we develop the regional transportation plan, which is uh, the transportation component of the vision. Uh, the, the RTP is multimodal, so uh, active transportation, walking, biking, uh, vehicles, roadways, uh, and then our transit uh, system, including rail and, uh, and bus service, and how those tie to uh, the, the future land uses or your land uses that uh, as a local community uh, uh, plan for and develop. Uh, we uh, developed this plan on a four-year cycle, so our current uh, plan that's adopted I was adopted in May of 2019. Uh, the, the new version will be here very shortly. We're about three and a half years uh, into this planning cycle. It's uh, financially constrained, uh, meaning it's not just a wish list of projects, but we, we do a very thorough job identifying funding uh, sources uh, for transportation type projects, and it must meet air quality conformity budgets um, that the state give us. Uh, we've broken this plan into three phases. So phase one is 2023 to 32. Uh, phase two would be 2033 to 42. And then phase three is the remainder from 43 to 50. Uh, the one th key thing you'll, you'll note here is that um, at the bottom of the screen there, um, all of the, the, pretty much all the funding sources, uh, federal, state, local, uh, tied directly to uh, the regional transportation plan. They look to the plan to identify the priorities uh, that are in phase one, um, including our own transportation improvement program uh, and, and the other programs, uh, like I said, that the state and federal um, uh, go towards. Um, where we're at in our timeline, as I may mention, we're, we're crossing that finish line. Um, you all helped us over the last uh, few years look at external forces and policies. Uh, that includes connected autonomous vehicles, teleworking, signal priorities, um, local street connectivity, things like that. Um, we've drafted a scenario a year ago. And then this last year, calendar year, uh, we uh, worked with you all to identify when projects were needed um, based on those phasing uh, the buckets. And then this last summer, we looked at financial constraint. And so we're moving into our public comment and final adoption of our plan. Um, just uh, noted here, we finished up our uh, fall transportation workshops with all the local communities, uh, which included um, the elected officials, so mayors, county commissioners, the uh, city councils, planning commission, and key staff. And we did this in consultation with UDOT and UTA, and they were very successful. Um, it, it was an interesting makeup in some, in some meetings we had more planning commissioners um, than we had staff from the local communities. In some community and some workshops we had uh, more city council members uh, than planning commissioners. So it was, it was a good mix and um, a lot of good conversations and, and input. So I uh, thank everybody for uh, working hard to get your um, elected officials uh, to these meetings and your planning commissions. Um, at the same time, we were doing stakeholder outreach. So we met with um, a community advisory committee, our resource agencies. We've sent an email out uh, to about 50 different resource agencies to provide input on the plan. Uh, we met with key landholders across the region. So Larry H. Miller Daybreak, the Point of the Mountain uh, Group, PRI, FRI, SLR, which is the LDS Church uh, landholding groups, Rio Tinto. We met with... Um, Colleges, so Salt Lake Community College, University of Utah, Weber State, um, Trails Foundation, Northern Utah, Pratt and Bike Utah. Chris, I just saw you jump in, appreciate it. Um, we met with Inland Port Authority and the Utahns for Better uh, Transportation. And we also did a, a, a outreach effort to the Western Growth Coalition uh, out there and they met in West Jordan. So I was able to, to preview the new public works uh, building there in uh, West Jordan. So thanks, Mayor Burton. Um, through this process, uh, we've received um, about 350 comments or so, and you can see they're broken up. Uh, we took comments from the first part of October 10th through the December 5th on the interactive map at those workshops and stakeholder meetings. So we've got about 100 comments on roadways, 68 on transit, and about 185 on active transportation. And this is pretty consistent with um, 
comments that we've received throughout our process um, by mode. So um, not a big surprise here. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest uh, for active transportation. Um, this is the first time we're financially constraining that plan. Uh, the governor's new statewide um, active transportation and trails initiative, um, new funding sources from the state. So there's a lot of eyes on active transportation. So I'm not surprised that uh, we did get as many comments there. Where we are um, with our financially constrained plan um, is we have about a billion dollars of available projected funds for active transportation, uh, almost 18 billion for roadways and about 6 billion for transit. Um, and how that breaks uh, down for available funds, which you can see there in the dark uh, red, and this isn't um, only existing funds, this is existing plus of some new funds that we feel are reasonable between now and 2050. Um, but you can see how those stack up against the actual needs. And this should not be a surprise to anybody. Um, there are always more needs than um, actual funds. And that's where we leaned on those comments we received from you all um, at our workshops and through the interactive map to help us um, realign priorities if needed. Um, and so you can see here by phase, um, same message, uh, we have more needs um, in each of the phases than we do actually have revenues um, for that. So um, we, uh, our schedule currently is, um, we're gonna go out to public comment between January 17th and February 16th. Um, and we're preparing the RTP document at the same time. So we're gonna go out for public comment, not only on the regional transportation plan, but our air quality conformity memorandum number 41 during that time frame. Um, we're going to come back to you all um, at the RGC TAC in April, RGC in um, May, and the Regional Council for final approval on May 25th um, for adoption. And then this next uh, spring, summer, fall, uh, we're working statewide on the unified plan coordination and outreach efforts. Um, so that we can uh, be prepared for uh, our fall kind of outreach efforts and the 2024 legislative sessions with a new unified plan, which is a, a compilation of all the uh, state uh, or the MPOs in the state and the, the rural part of the state's long range plans kind of compiled together. So we've been working on the unified plan uh, for a few years here for this, this version of it, but we've been um, as a state, uh, we've had a unified plan uh, since 2007, um, and I believe we're the only one in the state or in the country that still has a, a unified plan. So uh, with that, I'm going to drop in the chat here an updated link to an interactive map. So if you want, this is going to be the um, interactive map that we are putting out to um, public comment. Uh, recognize that it still um, might have a couple of things moving within it, but it's going to be the version um, on January 17th that we'll be uh, looking to get comments on. So uh, with that, are there any questions or thoughts or comments on the regional transportation plan? All right, with that, Ted, I believe you have the uh, next agenda item for guiding our growth. I do indeed. Thank you, Jory Johnner. <laughs> you are welcome. Uh, I just slow down my talking as I was trying to get to the actual agenda, right? So talk like a robot. Raise your fake Zoom hand if you have heard of the statewide growth conversation. Just curious. All right, a, a number of you have heard about this. Well, it's been starting to get into the papers a bit, uh, some earned media, um, and there's a survey out there. What I hope that you will take uh, at the conclusion of this presentation is you'll have a, a better sense of how this is structured and how it's unfolding and also 
how you might want to be involved if you choose to. But at a minimum, that you have a sense of where this is going, you're not surprised by it. Uh, you know, maybe you can answer a question from a council member about what is this and how does it relate to other plans and efforts that are out there. Um, the name for this now is guiding our growth, and that icon is both a beehive and an adorable, like little talk bubble. See, um, but it's uh, so, uh, and there's a website, but let me give you an overview of this. This is being led by the governor's office of planning and budgets, really Governor Cox's initiative, if you will. And the sort of the crux foundation of this is actually, uh, let's have a conversation, not so much about if Utah will continue to grow, because how do we control that? but rather how Utah should grow and what are the, the ways that growth might unfold that have the best outcome. And um, there's this basic point that we are making through this effort, which is that those very things that make Utah great, that we love, are also what draws people here. And uh, Absent sort of ruining our economy or making this a sort of a bad place to live, we're going to keep growing. And in fact, we've been growing rapidly now for, I think, you know, 40 years. Uh, so this is just nothing new. What's new is just the way it is unfolding in the, you know, the impacts that we're feeling like high uh, housing prices and the like. That's what's new. The amount of growth is not actually you know so the goals for this overall effort are these four that uh it's a chance for through guiding our growth for utahns to weigh in on how growth should unfold um at the same time help utahns better understand the growth plans that are already in place and how they relate and then after hearing how utahns would weigh in on how growth should unfold Let's work together to establish a list of shared big moves to achieve desired outcomes. These may, uh, I think, perhaps be a bit more state oriented and not necessarily local government oriented, but maybe some of both. And then uh, hopefully there's some, some buy-in and interest from communities statewide to advance those big moves in uh, your neck of the woods. I'll hopefully unpack that just a tiny bit in this. Um, the partners to this uh, are many. This is not comprehensive, uh, but you see uh, private sector like the Salt Lake Chamber, nonprofits like Envision Utah, a lot of the Association of Governments, uh, including WFRC, and as I mentioned, uh, led by the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. And the basic timeline is, we're wrapping up an initial round of, of gathering input. This is kind of like, well, what do you, what do we care about? What are we worried about? And what do we want to, what are our desired outcomes uh, relative to growth? And then as we move into the spring and summer of 2023, we're going to explore scenarios. And I want to give you a sense of what that means and what that might look like. And then in the fall of next year, identify those big moves or put a different way what are the things that we have to do that that give us our preferred uh, outcomes um, there's a website guiding our growth.utah.gov notably if you go there there is a live survey and if you can would you kindly share that with uh, those in your city uh, you could have that be in your city newsletter. You could simply uh, share it with your boards and uh, council, right? Anything that uh, makes sense to you, but uh, that is live this event. All right, so a big part of this conversation, this guiding our growth conversation is uh, scenarios. And scenario is like just a fancy way of saying, uh, it's a story of how the future might unfold. And so. An individual might have a scenario when they're younger of, well, what happens if I 
attempt to go to medical school or if I uh, go to New York and, and, and try to become a musician. There's two different paths. Let me think about what the implications of two different paths are. Well, let's think about the same with regard to how growth might unfold. What are those options for how growth might unfold? And then in turn, let's think through what they might mean for quality of life. Uh, now, notably, I want you to um, understand that the core audiences here are, uh, it's really the general public, but it's also, um, well, we're saying the words grass tops, uh, city councilors. But, uh, you know, a lot of city councilors are new to the idea of how should planning and zoning and community form and development patterns, how should they unfold? Uh, and so this is kind of, um, in a way, it's back to basics. Now, some of you might think, well, do we really need that? But there's always, there's constant turnover in city councils and planning commissions. It was so fascinating. I'll just do an aside that I was at uh, this uh, large Indigenous Utah effort. And at one point, they, they did a, hey, a show of hands of how many have, have filled out a survey uh, in an Envision Utah pro project. This is an Envision Utah event. And the majority of people did not raise their hand. So I just want to give you a sense of this. So as we are um, together working on developing these scenarios, and I, and I want to um, let you know, so WFRC is playing a role in this as one of the leads on the technical committee. But generally, we're we're trying to establish, well, what are those growth options that we're gonna explore? I mean, they might be super simply, what happens if growth tends to unfold mostly outside of existing communities or more within existing communities? But I'll put a finer point on that in just a minute. Let's explore some growth options. Then let's think through how they affect things like housing affordability or household affordability, water use, and then later on, we'll identify those big ideas to accomplish the desired results. And really, in this process of developing scenarios, we want to help people understand how the pieces fit together. And a lot of this, you all know, and it's almost second nature, uh, but it's not always thought of with people. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, lower density housing, more single family housing, it occupies a greater footprint. And that can have implications for uh, open space and how much infrastructure we need to provide. Uh, the location of growth, uh, how much is near opportunities where public transportation can be extended, helps make public transportation more viable. Uh, and so the location of growth affects transportation. Those are just two of countless uh, examples of how these pieces fit together. A lot of this, you all know, just second nature, but it's not always something that I think that um, residents connect the dots on. So this is the most rudimentary way um, to present what we're thinking of for draft scenarios that, uh, you can organize these in, on two major axes. One is, is growth more dispersed or is it more centralized? That's the y-axis. And on the x-axis, is growth more in a greenfield situation or more in an infill situation? Uh, and that's the x-axis. And so within each of those quadrants, there is a story to tell. Um, and uh, so the lower left growth tends to occur more in greenfield situations and in a dispersed pattern, suburban estates kind of thing. Um, if, it's, if it's dispersed pattern, but it's more through infill, then you might just see, you might see more accessory dwelling units or, hey, possibly more fourplexes within neighborhoods uh, and certainly uh, infill along commercial corridors. Uh, the centralized infill, the upper right is more um, downtown, town center, station area community. It's kind of a Wasatch choice sort of storyline. The upper left is kind of, uh, if you recall, when Daybreak was initially planned, 
it was a bit removed from the edge of urban development and it was kind of a satellite. We hear a lot of people who say, well, why don't we have more satellite cities? These might be complete communities, but they occur in locations a bit further away from existing communities. Uh, none of these are bad ideas. And the future is going to unfold with some of all of these. And But these different paths have different implications. And so the idea is, let's think through these implications. And then let's ask residents, what's the recipe you would pick for the area you live in and for the community you live in, both kind of a big area and your community? So we would explore these graphically and with metrics at a big area, like, like a valley. Uh, these are kind of example graphics. And then we would zoom in and kind of give a sense of, in a community like yours, what would this pattern look like, look and feel like, that kind of thing. So the graphic story is a big part of how we're planning to move forward, notably, our intention here is to not develop a new vision. It is not to develop like a replacement to Wasatch Choice or something that uh, is, a, is map, mapped specifically where you could imagine somebody in your community saying, I see that they penciled in idea X right at that intersection. There will be none of that. These are more about generalized patterns of um, the approach and what that approach might mean on a general level. And then we will take the appetite of people and have them think through trade-offs, pros and cons of these different storylines. Uh, I'll pause. I know I'm taking a little bit too long, but I'll pause and just see if there's any uh, questions so far. I'm most of the way through, uh, just a few minutes left. All right, hearing none, I'm either on mute, disconnected, or you're good. Uh, so after we explore these growth options, these will um, are aimed to unfold uh, in the spring. Uh, they will be coupled with, well, what are the out? What does it mean for quality of life? And in that question, what our our approach here is to pivot off of what. Uh, has been heard so far in the stakeholder input of, uh, of guiding our growth. This also, by the way, relates to these uh, Utah Land Use Institute meetings that have been held recently. And I would love to hear reactions from any of you of the value you got from those ULUI meetings, but part of what was tapped, tapped from them are hearing what uh, stakeholders want in their future. And these, these are maybe pretty obvious, but it's really important to hear them. Hey, let's meet our water needs. Let's have affordability. Let's be able to get to where we want to go. Um, and, and let's preserve community identity, have great access to the outdoors. In the rural spaces, we've been hearing a lot of people say strengthen our economy. We haven't been hearing that in the red hot economy of the Wasatch Front and in the rural areas maintain our farmland as well. And so we're taking that feedback and we're saying, well, let's forecast these 11 outcomes. 11 is a lot, so we may need to pair this back, but uh, getting at this range of things, and I won't do a reading of all of these, but they kind of hit those bases that I just looked at. Storylines, graphics, what they mean for quality of life, Later on, we get to the identify and identification of big ideas. Some local planners are involved already, and I am extending an invitation, if you want, to be part of the technical committee for guiding our growth. Uh, love to have you involved. These meet, I think it's on an every other month basis, although it might be more frequent, like maybe monthly basis, just while we're right in the heart of things. Our next meeting is planned on January 25th at 2.30 p.m. And I will stop sharing and find out how long I have spoken for at this time. But I hope that you've, you've gotten a sense of, okay, what this is, where it's, how it's, how it's unfolding, 
um, so that you won't be surprised by it, and that you also, in turn, have a, now have a sense of um, how you can be involved if you want to be involved. And would love to get uh, any sort of initial clarifying questions now. Like an episode of Twilight Zone. Ted, you were on mute that whole time. I didn't know if you started <laughs> your presentation yet. <laughs> Great, thanks, Drew. The UL UI wow. events were were really good. I don't know if um, others here had an opportunity to attend those, but I I did the the Weber County one and the Davis one. Um, we kind of divided and conquered at WFRC. So uh, great conversations, great input from local communities, um, from staff to elected officials. So um, if you haven't tuned into that part of the process or taken the survey, um, Cody and I put the survey in the chat for the guiding our growth um, conversation. So fill that out, um, help uh, keep, keep things moving in the right direction. We will send the link to the survey uh, with the follow-up email from this TAC. And in addition, if you are interested in being on the technical advisory committee, uh, list, just um, send a note to me uh, either in this meeting or ted at wfrc uh, oe.org, yeah, dot org. And notably, all of those meetings are Zoom, so they should be pretty convenient to attend. Great. All righty. Um, with that, uh, Hugh, you have item 3A, um, a little update on Park City Mobile Active Transportation Tour and some upcoming planning for a Davis, California mobile active transportation tour. Uh, hopefully uh, with your, you can, you can wake this group up with this, with this item. Morning, everybody. That help. I don't know if it did or didn't. Um, so many of you know uh, ourselves along with Mike Utah and other partners try and put on these mobile active transportation tours uh, around the region. And Park City Municipal Corporation was kind enough to host us this last fall. And just want to give you a little overview of that and put out an invitation. If any of your communities want to host a mobile active transportation tour with our support, we'd love to talk to you about that and put something together. So we are we were uh, in Park City with a bunch of folks on September 27th. And it was a beautiful fall day. And click, here we go. And we did a nice little loop around uh, around Park City. Um, obviously, many of you are familiar or aware of the great natural surface trails, the mountain biking that they have around town. However, they also have a, a pretty great urban trail network uh, to get people from destination to destination within town. And as we went through, um, Alex Roy, who works for Park City, um, we had, we had, was sort of our host, uh, along with some other folks there. And uh, we had people from MAG and from some private consultancies and from different cities, and uh, it was great to have everybody there. So we'd stop along the way. You can see the bikes that were on. These are bike share bikes up in Park City. They are known as the first uh, municipality in the country to have a bike share system that was fully electric, uh, so a full system of e-bikes, which is pretty cool uh, up there in Park City. One of the stops we made was to look at some of the bike parking they have. And they have a program up there um, that has to do with transportation demand where businesses can request bike parking at no cost. So if they want to have bike racks out in front of their business, they contact the city. There's a program set up with some funding and come and request that those, those bike racks to be installed. And we, we talk a lot in uh, our space about Hills uh, and facilities. <clears throat> of course, if there's nothing at the end, right? We need a whole ecosystem to improve our our, our biking networks. Uh, if there's no place to to lock up at the end and put your bike, that becomes more challenging and discouraging to folks. So it's cool they have a, a city-run program for folks to request bike parking up there. Uh, the wayfinding is a critical part, of course. You can see they have their their arrows and distances. Um, it's kind of funny, they're using one kilometer. I'm not quite sure why that is, sort of that European ski field or something. But uh, that was a real important aspect. We saw a lot of that on the tour. And there's Vendeline, who's on the call with us, Vendeline. 
Um, another big part of it was um, the public art along the way. So not only just the functionality of getting from place to place, but making it enjoyable. It's really great to see through Park City. And <clears throat> this is a trail um, that is part of uh, the rail trail that goes uh, further out into um, other other counties and um, is a big deal. But you can see sort of the left of the picture, this ramp. So the Park City has been working really diligently to connect these major regional trails that they have in their system to other parts of town. So this sort of, I'll call it an on and off ramp to the major trail system down into the developments that occur. And so making those links and the access points to the regional system really available for people um, has been a primary focus for Park City. And they're making some progress. Made a stop at a place where they did some tactical urbanism. You see the paint on the ground. Um, what you can't see is some you know, flexible ballers and things like that, but they're narrowing the street here, especially along this crossing, improving visibility for people trying to cross the street, avoiding parking in these locations and areas. And so right again, the, the tactical urbanism stuff gives uh, folks a chance to test some things out and experiment a little bit while not making it permanent, not making a huge financial investment. It's able to test a few different designs out and get feedback on them and make some changes. Um, one of the cool things that Park City has, has done really well, uh, and this is a newer project, is a lot of tunnels underneath the major UDOT thoroughfares through town. You see this one's located right near an elementary school uh, where the students uh, just getting out of school and heading down and going to be able to go and cross underneath this street, uh, which you can see has heavy truck traffic, uh, moves a lot of vehicles. And something a little bit innovative here, the darker panels along the edge of this, um, this tunnel and ramp, those are actually uh, solar panels that um, <clears throat> conserve energy to, to help with the heating elements underneath uh, the concrete, right? So a lot of snow from Park City, uh, difficult to maintain at times, so they have a melting system um, that helps get some of its energy from these solar panels, which is pretty cool. We'll see how long they last, um, but appreciate the innovation up there. It's just another tunnel project. This is an older one, but again, um, great way for families to get around and avoid having cross those, those busy streets uh, as they head down through these, these tunnels underneath the major roadways. Um, <clears throat> did talk about the bike chair system not being there full uh, full year uh, due to the snow, and they often pull up uh, their bike chair systems that you see as, and use them as snow storage areas, which is sort of a unique you know, dual purpose of the space. Um, and um, so again, Park City, I know it's sort of a, a unique area, but also a, a great sort of a little example of um, how, to, how to try and make it available and integrate urban trails and natural trails of bike share. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of visitors there, a lot of e-biking there. They're really um, trying to figure out how to best educate folks on e-bike standards and etiquette. So they have a lot of out-of-towners who jump on a, an e-bike and a rental for the first time, not just bike share, but from any bike shop, and uh, it's a new experience for them. So trying to get all everybody to play nicely together up in that space. So certainly a number of challenges. Um, they're, they're doing great stuff up there, and we appreciate them uh, hosting us. And again, if your community is interested in, in doing a mobile active transportation tour, please get in touch uh, with myself or Chris Wilty, who's on the call at Bike Utah, and we'd be happy to talk to you about those opportunities uh, for 2023. Uh, in the past, we've done these out-of-state tours. So there's a lot of great cities uh, across the country that have been identified as great biking places. We haven't done it for a couple of years due to the pandemic, but we're excited to announce that we're going to be going to Davis, California in 2023. Um, Davis is a platinum-level bicycle-friendly community as rated by the League of American Bicyclists about 70,000 people there, obviously a college population as well, um, but they're really well known and some of the first uh, instances of bike infrastructure in the country were in Davis. And uh, as it says here, you know, they've been taking bicycling seriously right, as a legitimate transportation choice for 55 years. So we're re really excited to be hosted by them. And uh, that's happening. The, the main tour day will be Monday, April 10th. Uh, they're in Davis and if you are interested, uh, feel, feel free to give me uh, a shout again, hugh at wfrc.org, and happy to coordinate with you. It's a little ways off, but we want to get on people's radar, sort of save the date, because uh, you know it can be challenging um, to get these scheduled. And just as an FYI, this is pay your own way. 
That's not something that MDFRC or Bike Utah pays for, but we coordinate it and make sure all the logistics are taken care of. All right, thanks, Joy. Thanks to you. Um, yeah, great opportunities uh, to attend these mobile active transportation tours. Um, always a different feel getting out of uh, your car seat uh, to a bike or even on foot walking around and seeing uh, an area and how it uh, feels and works. Get good examples. There's great conversations with other elected officials and planners and staff uh, when we do these and um, kind of impromptu here as we look to the 2023 uh, mobile active transportation season, <clears throat> Hugh works with Bike Utah. So both uh, Chris and Hugh are on this. If you uh, think your community would be a good um, local mobile active transport tour uh, area, get a hold of those two um, and you guys can work to kind of uh, set that up. Um, we've done in the past, um, you know, a few to half a dozen local tours, um, which sometimes a little easier than the out of state ones. But uh, think about that, or if not even your community, if you know an area that would be good um, to get out and ride and show good examples, or you know, some things that could be fixed. Uh, coordinate with you and Chris on that. All right, um, disruptive technologies and policy section. So. Uh, we have a special guest uh, today that uh, is joining us. We got uh, Jared Eiselman with the uh, Department of Aeronautics. I'm going to give us a little update on drone deliveries. Um, so turn it over to you, uh, Jared, um, to run us through uh, what you know and what we can expect to see. All right. Well, thanks, Jory. Um, and Mike Malloy, if you're still on, I might put you on the spot in a minute here just to ask a question. Um, let me uh, let me share my screen real quick with you guys. Uh, just to check. And hopefully you can see this little presentation I've got. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so we did pass Senate Jared, Bill 1. Yep. We, we can see it and um your speaker notes on the side. So I'm not sure if you're intended to, to share that, but if so, go for it. Yeah, you know what, that's that's fine. It's not like I'm hiding any secret squirrel stuff. In here. <laughs> right on. You guys can write them down if you want, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so we did finish our legislative report uh, for advanced air mobility across the state. And I'll just take a few minutes, um, as you know, Zipline is in the partnership with Intermountain Healthcare. They're operating out of South Jordan right now. Uh, not only are they delivering some uh, both prescription and over-the-counter medicines for Intermountain Healthcare, um, they also deliver everything from a bag of M&Ms to you know that last-minute Christmas can of cranberries if you need it, uh, whatever. Um, they do have a limited range right now, but they are operating. So. <clears throat> And then drone up uh, is actually gonna is actually is applying for business license and permits in several cities in Utah, um, and it's I know they're working with the city of Sandy. I know they're working with the city of Centerville. And and Mike, I know they talked to Harriman. How how is that going? Um, their legal counsel has been great to work with. Um, we feel like we are we have a mutual goal that we want to make this work we're just trying to figure out the legal framework um as everyone can appreciate this is certainly something that our ordinances did not anticipate and uh, we're just trying to yeah work through those issues but their but their uh their legal um collaboration has been superb fantastic that's good to hear that's good to hear um for for drone up the walmart locations they picked or, or I should say Walmart picked um, it, it it required a certain customer density within a, a a given distance from the location so Harriman was quite a, a perfect fit for them so was Sandy Centerville a little bit smaller of a town a little bit more difficult to work with but um, the population density is right there by the Walmart uh, although they do have some unique uh, 
height restrictions and limitations on that particular building. So that is, but both of those are still moving forward. Both of them are still moving forward. Um, in our use cases for the report, uh, we did expand beyond drone package delivery into passenger air mobility and emergency services. We do have several companies. Um, I mean, I'm not under an NDA, so I guess I could tell you who they are, but, but just for anticipation purposes, I'll say there's one in particular that is looking at Utah very closely for manufacturing and another uh, for emergency services that, that is really looking to have Utah be what the FAA calls a watershed moment. Uh, and the FAA is helping us with that, the uh, Division of Integration. And it will be a really interesting method of getting a first responder to the scene of an injury or an accident really quickly without having to have the aircraft make a round trip. So it's a, it's a one-way flight in the aircraft. The first responder is there on the scene taking care of things. The first responder and the, and the patient at that point uh, ride off in an ambulance. Um, and then a truck comes and picks up the aircraft. It, it really is a unique uh, opportunity for Utah to test that technology, and that is coming. Um, a couple of things, if you're, if you're planning, if you're doing community planning, uh, any kind of um, for advanced air mobility within your community, we have several of our reports, U-Track reports up on our website. Uh, we do have an AAM corridor simulation for Salt Lake, and you can see how that works. Um, and then we did put the new report on the website as well. If you just Google Utah Division of Aeronautics, there is an advanced air mobility tab. Uh, if you scroll down, it says advanced air mobility. The new legislative report is at the top of the, of the list. <coughs> Um, and you will see legislation this January on advanced air mobility, a couple of things that we're going to address uh, right off the this year is, is defining AEM. What is a vertiport? What is an aerial corridor? Who manages that? What is unmanned traffic management? Who manages that? Uh, those will be those definitions will be included in the bill. Um, state licensing and permitting. Uh, how you know, for these companies that come in and want to do either drone package delivery or aerial taxis, where do they have to get licensed and how do they have to get licensed? Um, and vertiports, if you want to build a vertiport, how do you license that? That is all addressed in the bill. You'll see that um, aircraft registration is addressed in the bill and that'll be put in the hands of the Division of Aeronautics. We'll be working on a rulemaking for that for about 12 months. And then next legislative session, you'll see actual, uh, an actual fee schedule and an online process to register uh, unmanned aircraft. Uh, and then as registration fees get put in place, next session, you'll see a, a restricted account. And then that probably doesn't mean much to any of you, but the other pieces do. Um, the other thing you will see coming up in this legislation is uh, overlay zones, airport overlay zones, and those will be transitioned in, uh, or added on as vertiport overlay zones as well. And for planning, your planning offices, that will be important to look at. So keep an eye out for, for those. Uh, they'll come from Senator Harper. So yes, there you go. Zoning language uh, for takeoff and landing operations, municipal permitting and business license, that's addressed in the, in the bill. Uh, as I said, the local vertiport overlay zone, I kind of talked about all this ahead of time. Got to have myself a little bit. And, and then we also included in the report a timeline, uh, a phase implementation for advanced air mobility. Um, we're already looking at electrifying uh, our first airport in Bountiful. That's already on our books. Um, I know Vernal and Logan are chomping at the bit to be next because we see electric aircraft coming out. Uh, we see the, uh, the growth and expansion of beyond visual line of sight for drone package delivery, meaning that Zipline could, could operate out of South Jordan, but deliver packages in Tooele or Ogden, even as far as Ogden, they have quite a distance um, by 2024. So I mean, think about it, we're in December of 22, that's 18 months away. Um, and then for aerial taxis, anyway, we've got a phase timeline for, for the infrastructure that needs to be put in place what that needs to look like and, and how quickly 
it needs to be comprehensive. And there's a little bit more of that. Phase one, two, three years, uh, meet what we already have, zip line and drone up. Uh, phase two, we're looking for digitizing the airspace between Ogden and Provo. And then phase three, the entire Wasatch Front. And in about 15 years, we'll have connected the entire state. So there's just a quick uh, glance of phase one. Uh, again, uh, drone up on the top of the slide and zip line on the bottom. And then if you guys are interested, this is our state investment versus private industry investment. For every dollar a, a local government entity or the state uh, puts in, you know, there is, there is a leverage of private industry investment to the, to, toward, to the infrastructure we build. We build the infrastructure, they come in and build the business and build the operation. And these are just some of the cost estimates, so. If you're interested. But Jory, that's the update I have right now um, that I, I can that I can give to this point. Uh, we, we are <laughs> look, looking for the legislation in January. You can expect to see that come from Senator Harper and uh, and more in the next session as well. No, thanks, Jared. I know you're uh, continuing to move this forward. Um, what's what's interesting is when we as if you know from my presentation, I, I noted two years ago, we started talking about external forces and policies, right? And there are 22 of those. And one of those items was drones and it was drone delivery and, uh, you know, drone passenger moving. And as we move through those 22 forces, our peer groups, you all, um, you know, are some partners at the state and UTA, um, we, we quickly... Uh, I think at the time said, we don't have enough information on drones. This isn't going to happen that fast. We'll, we'll, let's just kind of put that on the shelf and address that in the next plan, right? So the 2027 planning process, and we'll, we'll keep our eye on it, but, you know, nothing's going to move forward. And then, you know, almost immediately as we move forward with some of the other items that we had more confidence in the connected and autonomous vehicles or, you know, micro mobility and some of those other items, you know, Jared reached out to us and was like, yo, um, we're going to start this in uh, 2022. Um, I need you all to pay attention how this connects to transportation and land use in general. So appreciate Jared and his team working with us. We've had multiple meetings at WFRC with um, the department there. And um, it'll, it, as you can see here, I, I appreciate Jared, you um, you know, kind of laying out the game plan and the, the phases, um, and it's just going to get stronger. And I think, you know, as you're working with local communities, um, uh, this, this group here, um, you know, we might want to do like at least an annual checkup, um, or if, you know, uh, provide that connection between the, the drones and um, our local communities, because this is our group that is, you know, normally made up of um, all of the planners are invited throughout the region. And uh, sometimes we're fortunate enough to get a few elected officials to join us as well. So um, appreciate that update and um, excited to see and, and a tiny bit surprised, like I said, um, this is moving forward so quickly, um, but things uh, things are uh, moving quick, I guess, and surprising. Yeah, things move fast. And I, and I will say, Jory, I have been very, very conservative on this timeline very conservative um if if it if it were an industry you know if, if, if i had an industry partner sitting here next to me they'd be shaking their head going no it's, it's going to be a lot faster than that so right yeah keep that no, in mind I mean, that i'm very conservative but they're pushing they're aggressive they're pushing they're, hard they're moving it right um scott looks like you've got your hand raised uh question uh yeah jared real quick you mentioned some potential legislation um uh, that uh, Senator Harper might be presenting. Would you recommend, uh, I know that we, we've been contacted in West Jordan about um, from drone up, but it, it, should we wait for that that legislation before we monkey around with any local ordinances or do we have any direction or suggestions? Um, 
I mean, the session's right around the corner anyway, right? So. Yeah, the session's right around the corner. To be honest, uh, Scott, the the draft language is out there. Um, it's from the September 21st, I want to say September 21st interim transportation committee. And if okay. you look that up, um, the, the language is posted on the legislative website. It's, I'm not giving you any kind of secrets. Um, and I would say look through that and then look through the report. Go to the Utah Division of Aeronautics website, Google us, look through the report. You will see what's in the report come out in legislation. So I don't think you have to wait. I think you already have the information you need. Okay, perfect. Um, Jared, it looks like there's a comment in the chat from uh, Nestor. I haven't read through the whole thing, so I'm not sure if... Uh... It's just a Destro, is that a, just a comment or did you want Jared to speak to that? Just just a quick, uh, well, hello everybody. Um, uh, the city of Boston uh, requires some uh, type of easement to preserve the air above the building. And when I learned about it, I thought, why are they doing that? Is this drone corridor going to be uh, a trigger for Preserving the right um, for no trespassing into um, some private area above the building. So there will be navigation easements, what we call navigation easements, um, and they will they will protect. Let's say a vertiport is built. Let's say a vertiport is built in Murray, somewhere in Murray, right? Mm -hmm. And they they will protect the airspace for the approach and departure paths of that vertiport, much like a part 77 service at a, at a traditional airport. Um, mm -hmm. It will protect those, the navigation easements will protect that airspace so that nothing can penetrate or protrude uh, into that airspace, creating what we call a, a, an navigation hazard. Mm -hmm. So that the, the, that's, a, that's a life safety issue, right? right. So those will, we will write the code for those. I don't think it's in this bill. I think it's in next year's. Um, okay. We waited. We we decided to wait on navigation easements for 20, 2024 session. Thank you. All righty. Any other questions for Jared? All righty. Um, appreciate that, Jared, for the update. Always uh, exciting. We are um, going to move item five, planning and zoning roundtable for 2023 to our February meeting. So um, uh, we'll bump that. Uh, looks like we're going to finish this meeting a tiny bit early. Um, reminder, next year's plan tech meetings, we have them set up for uh, Wednesday mornings at uh, nine o'clock, similar to today, um, February 15th. April 19th, July 12th, September 20th, and December 13th. If you have any, um, if you do a quick check of your calendar, if there's anything that conflicts with those uh, dates, um, let us know. We have some flexibility to move uh, the meetings around as long as we have a, enough notice. Um, with that, uh, thank you everybody. Um, for attending today's meeting. Stay safe, get that shovel out, shovel your driveway, sidewalks. Um, and if there's nothing else uh, from anybody in the group, uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thanks, Michael. Somebody's awake. And I'll take that as uh, concurrence as people are dropping off now. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.